Hey everybody, thank you for coming on to my channel again, uh, Do More. Now, as you know, my channel is all about doing business, uh, investing wisely, and being the best that you can be personally. Today, I talked to this guy called Bramal Vazudevan. He's the founder of this private equity firm called Creador. He's doing some amazing things, and today he shares his experiences in terms of how he built his business, in terms of how he invests in private equity. And uh, I'm sure you like this video because he has a lot of stuff to share. If you like this video, uh, share it, comment on it, and subscribe. Thank you for joining. Ramal Vasudevan, Create All Capital, private equity legend. <laughs> thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you thank for doing you. this. Mm -hmm. um, before we start um, in, into the investment journey and, and all, all those principles behind it, um, let's, let's start with who is Ramal Vasudevan and how did you enter this world of investment? Right. Um, so I, I actually entered the, this whole industry by chance. Uh, I, when I was growing up, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do at university, uh, as many of us didn't at 18. So I was deciding between engineering and business. And uh, I thought if I did engineering, I could always have the option of going back to business, uh, as opposed to business not being able to go back to engineering. So I did engineering. Uh, and then when I graduated, I went to work in, uh, in a company, Malaysian Tobacco. So I learned about marketing. Uh, and after business school, uh, I came back and I worked in strategy and marketing again. And by chance, I had a couple of friends who started a private equity fund in India in late 99. Uh, and in 2000, I joined them, uh, not knowing anything about investing. Uh, and uh, 19 years later, here I am. So that's a short summary, but I've done a bit of reading on you, Pramal. And obviously, you went to Imperial College in London. Mm -hmm. um, you did aeronautical engineering uh, first, no less. Um, what made you decide between to, to plumb for in, uh, engineering versus uh, business? Business, because you study business, in, in right? Sure. So typically, people do business rather than study business. But h why did you choose engineering? Sure. So I think, as, as I mentioned, you know, I had an interest in engineering, but I also had an interest in commerce and, you know, essentially, how do you make money? Uh, and I felt that at, at 17 or 18, um, you know, the, there was less risk in doing engineering. Because as you know, if you do engineering as a subject matter, yeah. uh, it's really a way of thinking uh, and you know resolving problems. And if doing that, you can always switch later into accounting, business, finance, and so on and so forth. Uh, as opposed to if you actually did finance and accounting as a as a subject, you could never go back and do something technical like engineering. I think aside from that, engineering actually gives is really teaches you how to think. You know, I think it's a great degree in terms of uh, you know, going through the structure of identifying issues, resolving, you know, coming up with a framework how to resolve things and finding solutions, right? And, and I think in this day, in, in my time, engineering was the big subject. Today, you have other subjects like computer science, data science, and so on, which are alternatives you know, to diving straight into a finance degree. Yeah, but some would say that engineering is engineering and that's still very much the flavor of the day, right? In terms of where the technology is. Mm -hmm. um, so then you went from engineering and apparel um, and then you went into tobacco um, and presumably that was because it was the first corporate job and you needed to get into the thing. Um, and then I think you also did some, some time at Astro, mm -hmm. which is the pay TV broadcast company. Um, what did you learn there? And, and then what made you transition from there to um, private equity? Sure. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I started off in uh, what was then Malaysian Tobacco, which is now BAT. And one of the reasons I went there is because it had a management training program. So I think over the course of a year, they had a highly structured program of expo exposing you to different functions uh, of business. And that was clearly very interesting. And, and I learned a lot in that process. Uh, in between, I left to go into strategy consulting, completely hated it. I McKinsey, thought it was right? uh, B uh, BCG. BCG. I just thought it was too academic. Uh, and uh, very quickly, I moved back with BAT to the UK, where I was a global brand manager for a couple of years. Um, so the transition to Astro really happened after business school. Uh, when I graduated in 97, I came back uh, and I worked uh, in Astro initially in strategy and planning and later in marketing. And uh, the, I think the attraction, I had actually done a summer internship at uh, Maxis and at Astro prior to that. So I had a little bit of a feel for what this whole business of pay television was. And some of the things that were appealing at that point in time was, A, it was a new industry. Astro, Astro had just launched in 96. Uh, it was a very well-established industry in other parts of the world. But uh, it was an, a chance to really be part of a, a, a new business or a new industry evolving uh, in Malaysia. So. 
So it sounds as if your um, career up until then was quite concerted, as in you knew what you wanted, you knew the choices, you knew the permutations and the consequences of doing it. How much of that was because you, you had sussed it out by then? And how much of it was because you had parents who gave you good advice? Sure. Well, actually, it was not planned at all, to be honest. And okay. I sort of fell into everything along the way. So. Can't, can't, can't be that, so, I mean, can't, can't be that coincidental, <laughs> man. There's no way, right? Well, actually, it's funny because MTC happened because my mother actually saw a newspaper ad in the newspaper and cut it out and sent it to me. And I applied from there. Um, BCG happened because they advertised in the papers and they were setting up a no new office. just new, like that. Yeah, well, they were setting up a new office. There was no consulting firms in Malaysia in 1991. Um, and so that happened. And it was an area of interest, but there were no opportunities prior to that. Um, Astro happened because, uh, you know, I knew uh, uh, Mr. Krishnan at that point and uh, that opportunity uh, happened because of that, you know. And uh, so, so it wasn't like there was a five-year plan that said, we could, you know, we're going to do this and that and that, you know. So I think at all times, you know, it was sort of you turn up at that point in time and these were the opportunities and fortunately they worked out quite well, you know. So what did mum do? What did dad do? Were they, were they uh, actually, they were the most, uh, my, my parents were, my, my dad was a lecturer, my mother was a teacher. No kidding. So they added no value in my decisions around business and so on. Ha, have you but ever studied this phenomenon where children always, well, not always, sometimes they cannot, go completely tangential in terms of where their parents are. Right. Have you ever tried to intellectualize that and figure it out? Okay. In terms of where your parents were and where you ended up? <laughs> Have you ever well, thought about it? No, I, I haven't actually thought about so it. But I guess, you know, the thing is when, you know, my parents were civil servants, you know, they, they worked for the government all so their so life. So the education, do really well Yeah, so I think, I think they, they were actually, to be honest, quite relaxed parents. There was never like you had to do the best, you had to get the top marks, you know. They were like, do your own thing, find your own space. No way. And, and that was great. And I think that's important. I think too many parents these days are overtly focused on education. Uh, I was just laughing with some friends over <laughs> lunch today that parents would send their kids to boarding school and turn up six times a year to see them. You know, I mean... That's not parenting. Mm, that was not what, like the old days. You went yeah, to the UK on the 1st of June and... Yeah. Oh, sorry, 1st of September and you're lucky to come back on the 30th of June the following right. year, right? right? Yeah, and then you went at six years old to boarding school and that's it, that's the parenting over for the first one. Correct, <laughs> yeah. After that, right, they took <laughs> over and outsourced the whole thing. Um, okay, just very quickly on the whole subject of, of where you were in terms of your childhood, right? Were your siblings as well? Uh, uh, did your siblings perform to you to, to you as well? Or did sure. were I, you I, like I an outlier? I, had, uh, I only had one other sister and uh, she went to Canada to study and she decided to stay on in Canada. Okay, so. okay, okay. That's interesting because as a father, right? And, and for, for most parents, you know, trying to figure out which is the best ingredient for children's success. But then, so you did the corporate thing and then you joined your friends, presumably quite early on because you went to Chris Capital. Correct. Which was India, right? That's right. That's interesting. Yeah. So, you know, so I think deep down in, in, uh, in my uh, feeling, I always felt I wanted to be part of something more entrepreneurial, right? And my two previous uh, jobs were really in fairly large institutions, right? BAT is this global giant, you know, all around the world. And Astro was uh, already establishing itself as a fairly, you know, significant entity. But I wanted to do something uh, more entrepreneurial and something that would give me the, the pleasures of being part of building something, as well as a chance to potentially create some wealth uh, for myself and for my family. Uh, and so I was, you know, by the time I got to 98, 99, a lot of friends from business school had moved to Silicon Valley and were already doing well and, and uh, you know, had put away some uh, nest egg for the future. Because you were MBA Harvard, right, as well? Correct, yeah. yeah. So we all graduated in 97. It was the peak of the dot-com era. Everybody was, you know, going out to the West, joining startups. And when you're Asian, it's not actually common to go in a startup you know you always feel that you're gonna what happens if i fail you know yeah. what will they say what would my parents think <laughs> you know i think it's a very asian thing right yeah. and i think that's changing to some extent but uh, so we are built to be inherently risk averse right so go work for an established company you know you know make sure you can you know support your family etc etc but i think to be fair uh, uh, it was a great opportunity in the sense that my two uh, partners at that point who were classmates at, at uh, business school, uh, had started the firm in 99. So to some extent, they took a lot of the early stage risks. They already had a small fund, which was only $64 million, but they could at least pay a, pay a decent uh, salary. So the, the risk levels in that sense wasn't low. 
it was a completely new industry for me. I not, never even took any subjects on investing at business school. But what I had, which I brought to the table, and in any partnership, you want a balance of different types of people. So they had more of a finance background, and I came from more of an operations background. In that sense, it was quite complementary. And uh, so, you know, this, the, the excitement was really being part of investing and building new age companies out of India. And uh, so it was not only leaving Malaysia, it was leaving uh, uh, Malaysia to go to India, but also a new industry. So two big changes all at once. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because your entrepreneurial journey came not from your parents because they were lecturers and teachers. They, they, it came from you. In your opinion, because you, you invest in entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think they're made or do you think they're born? I think they're absolutely born, right? Yeah. I mean, of course, you can come, and as, as we have lots of friends who come from... Uh, families who are in business yeah. and clearly they have a you know a, an advantage in that sense because they grew up listening about you know business all their lives and, and many of them then you know uh, succeed their parents in their business but in in terms of a lot of entrepreneurs you know if you look at their backgrounds there was no trace of entrepreneurship in their past you know whether it's bill gates uh, or Mark Zuckerberg or you know uh, any number of people and uh, so i think to to that extent you believe that it's sort of inherent in you, you know. There is an interest that then eventually manifests itself in an idea. You know? Interesting, so, interesting. Yeah. So then you went to India, and I think you had obviously you went in with the shares, right? So you must have either got I don't know how you worked it out, and then you went into India, which is the the the, the it's like the Yukon, right? It's like the the untapped um, kingdom. What were some of the things that you saw when you went there in the late nineties? Sure. So I think the first thing is why why take that venture? So one, yeah. as I mentioned, was you know doing something. Uh, new and something that could give us a chance to build uh, some wealth. Uh, and then thirdly, when you thought about India, uh, I never lived in India. So I think really, to me, there were a couple of big ideas. a big market that was still far behind. And my thinking was that if India was going to narrow the gap with countries like Malaysia and elsewhere in a large market, there would be many things to do, right? So it wasn't any huge... 50 page you know rationale and why one should do that it was it was big ideas and i think that's really important when you talk about creating significant value you have to look at big ideas right and not that incremental next uh, next journey um, and so that was what made me make the move and in the initial uh, four or five years uh, i actually ran our u.s office and we were doing a lot of cross-border investments between indian companies going to the u.s for example in call centers we were pitching American companies to migrate their back office to India. Fantastic. And then we were also looking at IT services where, you know, there was a shortage of coders for Y2K at that point, if you remember, in 2000. Uh, and again, India offered huge talent pool at half the price, right? So we were focused on, we built the largest call center business uh, called Wipro, which we sold to, sorry, Spectrumine, which we sold to Wipro. Uh, we built, uh, you know, and invested in IT services companies. We had credit collection businesses, tech support businesses, and so on. So it was very interesting. That was the initial journey. And then four years uh, into it, uh, the Indian market really took off in 2004. And then we decided to consolidate everybody in India and focus on the domestic economy. And that was, uh, you know, from the end of 03, early 04, India went through four or five years of amazing uh, growth and, and value creation in the stock market. You know, property prices went up five and tenfold in the space of two or three years, you know. So, uh, and that became the, the start of this, you know, long uh, catch up for India compared to China, you know. So. Yeah, uh, it sounds as if you've had, I mean, you know, those early years were, were easy but by the sounds of it with the Wipro exits and all that, but it can't have been easy all the time, right? Sure. What were some of the early obstacles? Well, I, I think whenever you start a new venture, it never is easy, right? right? Yeah. And, uh, and I'll talk about Chris Capital and I'll talk about Credo as well. So when, when, we, when I started it with my colleagues at Chris Capital, it was a small fund of 64 million. And we had two strategies. One was what we call labor arbitrage, which was moving outsourcing jobs to India. And the other one is what we call concept arbitrage, which was taking concepts in the, dot, in the whole kind of dot-com era, like the Ebays and the Amazons, and bringing them to India. So whilst the first one worked, the second one was a mitigated disaster. <laughs> there wasn't even internet connection in India. Yeah, yeah, so we yeah. were bringing 
Amazon and Ebay's and, and uh, you know, monsters to <laughs> India and people couldn't even connect, connect to the internet. So we lost a lot of money there, right? That was number one. How did you come back from those? So I think fortunately the first bucket, the labor arbitrage did very well. And so in net terms, we still delivered a 30% return in that fund, right? Uh, of course, 10 years later, we were too early. Uh, even concept arbitrage would have done very well in India. So that's one. I think the second thing is India itself, although it was a big country, hadn't quite got its act together. So 2001, 2002, and the large part of 2003 were very quiet years. You know, the politics was a bit unsettled. The global economy was still recovering from the 2001 crash. Um, and so, you know, there are times where you question yourself and say, is there enough to do? You know, we were investing, you know, 10 and 20 million dollars a year as opposed to what we do now, which is 150 million. And um, I think in those types of environments, you have to do two things. One, you have, to, you have to look at your original thesis. Do you think that big opportunity is still going to be there? You know, it might take another two years, it might take another five years. So, so then you have to have patience, right, and perseverance. And those are the hard things uh, being an entrepreneur because, you know, there are always times where you look at it and say, is this working or is it going to yeah. work out? Or should I really go back to working in my you know, conventional corporate job. You know. Cushy corporate job, right? right? Yeah. And the same thing happened at Credo when I started again in 2011, uh, having to rebuild a team and go and talk to investors and 90% of them said, this doesn't make sense, you know? So I met 350 investors and it took us a year to close 35. So nine out of 10 meetings result in a no. Incredible. And so I think as any entrepreneur, I don't think this is unique to myself, I think one has to have the confidence in yourself, the patience, the perseverance to get through that 90% failure rate. And even when you started Credo, this is after all those years you spent in India and Correct, learning yeah. all those lessons, battle-hardened yeah. lessons. What were some of the key takeaways of having run a PE fund in India, which sure. you then took it to Malaysia and still only won one out of 10 years? Correct, yeah. So. So I think we, we had a very successful uh, partnership, a uh, great team. Uh, which so then you're together. out of there completely by then. Yeah, and, and you know, my, actually the reason uh, we could, I could have lived there for the next 50 years basically, but I always had this desire to come back home to Malaysia and to, to live here because I, you know, uh, like my family, we love Malaysia and we love all its imperfections as well. Uh, and uh, the question was how to build a business out of here. So I thought we could take the formula we had of the style of investing, uh, but Malaysia itself was going to be too small. But we would use Malaysia as our hub and we would serve the region from here. And most people would looked at me and said, you must be crazy, the place to do it is Singapore. And uh, so I said, no, I think we, we're going to prove that we can build this out of Malaysia. So we started again and uh, I think once we had this great track record in India, we did 43% a year for 11 years. Um, people, when you start again, Sorry, hang on. Let me just rewind. Forty-three percent a year for the last from two thousand to two thousand eleven with, with Chris with, with Chris Capital. Right. We did forty-three percent a year return to our investors. Uh, that's not know. typical, right? Obviously, no, that's not typical. I mean, I think in private equity today, if you deliver twelve percent consistently, those over days might be gone by now, right? Those are days. Yeah, I mean, also India has become a lot more competitive. So yeah. the reason we did very high returns, which is also a good learning, is you have to get there early. Yeah. And so you take a bit extra risk, a bit extra frustration, but you position yourself to when, uh, you know, the market is going to take off, right? Uh, and so I, and it's like playing ice hockey. You don't go to where the puck is. You've got to go where the puck's going to be. Yeah. You know, you've got to meet that. Uh, so I think that's what it is. Today, of course, in India, I think it's harder. I mean, I think we've still managed to deliver 25% a year, which yeah. is our goals. And, uh, you know, and, and I think with some clever strategies and patience, uh, you know, one can do that, you know, so. Uh. So that, that decision to, to leave India and your partnership there, um, a lot of people, nine out of 10, would have just said, hey, let's, let's keep it here. We're doing really well. Sure. Let's just build up my, so I presume that was a smaller share, less than 50%, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Malaysia is great, I understand. Kind of be the only reason, right? Did you want to own the business outright or at least majority? Sure. I don't think it was ownership so much. And today, even today, we have, uh, you know, a number of partners in the business. Uh, but I think it was, one, a desire to live in Malaysia. And you could have gone from, you could have taken Chris to, to, in, to Malaysia. 
Uh, we could, unfortunately, my partners there did not want to do anything outside India. Ah, so, yeah. so, so, so. That, it was a conversation I had saying, hey guys, why don't we expand our remit to cover Southeast Asia? And they were like, hey, we have 1.3 billion people here. Yeah. We don't necessarily need another 600 million people in Southeast Asia. <laughs> exactly. And look, Southeast Asia is complicated, right? It's not just one country, it's 10 countries. Uh, well, India is complicated too. It's not one country, it's 28 states and yeah. so on. You know? so, um, so I think uh, that desire was more, hey, to, to come home. My son was going to high school, so that was a transition point. And uh, my parents were getting older and my, my in-laws as well. And so it was a chance to really you know, be... Uh, be closer to them, uh, and so on, and um, and then a chance to see whether one could do it again, right? So actually, most entrepreneurs can build once. And how old were you then? Uh, so one? in 2011, I was uh, 43, okay. and uh, you know, so you know, young enough to make another yeah. push. And this is already round two, having after having learned 11 years in the in the trenches. Correct. Yeah. 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 So then Creadoc happened. You met 350 people. You closed 35. One That's out right. of 10. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the numbers now. You raised... So our first fund was hard, right? Yeah. So we, we had a goal. Uh, having raised uh, Fund 5, the last fund at, at Chris Capital, we, we were trying to raise a billion. We had 4 billion a demand. So we were turning away money. Uh, That's and always so, nice. Which was nice. And now when I started at Credo, I thought we'd raise... 388 was the number on the... 100 million dollars. The, 100 million the, US dollars, right? Yeah. Well, and also a nice Chinese number. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the the... The reality was we only raised 130. So we had a goal and we only came in about a third of that goal despite a lot of work and traveling. And 95% of our money came from overseas as it does today, right? I mean, we're not getting any favors from local institutions and, and, uh, and, and so on. So the first fund is all about proving the concept, right? In the fund management business, the first one is always the hardest. And a lot of people don't get there, and those who get there often fail, you know. So, so we had to make sure that we had the right team, right, that could uh, not only deliver the results, but work together as a team. Um, and that's another reason why investors are weary of first funds, because they're not sure if these partners are going to stay together, and can they stand each other when they yeah. have to work together. Yeah. I think the second thing is we have to find good investments, and we have to make money, right? And to some extent, we were a bit lucky. Markets were still low at that point and we were able to get into, uh, one of our first deals was Old Town White Coffee, yep. which had gone public and was trading 10% below its IPO price. Nice. But it was ridiculously cheap. It was trading at 10 times earnings, and we knew the comparables were 20 times earnings. So it, we literally decided uh, after lunch with the, with the owner, S.H. Lee, and we shook hands uh, at the end of a one hour lunch and bought 5% of the company. Just like that. Just like that. You know? So you know great businesses when you see it. And then thirdly is once you find good companies, we had to add value to the businesses. And that came mainly up in Fund 2 uh, when my partner Kevin joined us and we created Credo Plus. And the idea was really to you know, work with companies and instill in them new strategies on how to grow their business faster. You know? and, and then four, you have to know how to sell. Great companies, but you know, you, if you can't sell, you've got to exit. Yeah. Right? And that's a big, you won't be you'll be surprised how many funds in this region struggle to exit things. So I was recently quoted as saying, you know, exits are difficult when you pay ridiculous valuations, which is what we're dealing with this time. Well, so you've got you to pay the right price, right company, right price, and then, you know, plan for an exit, you know? So you, you've outlined four steps, right? One is obviously proof of concept, which through, through Chris, you've kind of like done that, mm-hmm. but then you have to go and find some ideas, right? And the finding ideas, maybe then it was easier, but the principles are still the same. Um, some people say it's the management. Some people say it's the scale of the idea. Some people say it's the scale of the market, right? Um, what, what, what are your principles for finding the right ideas? It's a complicated uh, point, right? Is it, how much of it is gut feel? No, I, I think there, it, there is a science, okay. right? And I, th- I think these things can be... I'm not sure you can quite put it in a computer, but you know, a lot of it is about systematically... Uh, and, and, and actually, it's quite a difficult task at, at, at Credo. We have a foundation called Credo Foundation, and we're working to launch a financial literacy platform uh, soon, which will take us probably another three or four months. And one of the subjects is how do you buy a stock, right? Or how do you invest? And it is an incredibly difficult question, but I'll, I'll just talk about it briefly. I think the first thing is about industry. You know, I mean, we are fundamentally growth investors, so we're not buying distressed assets and trying to make it better. So we are looking for sectors which are generally rising, right? 
and uh, and are growing, right? So f for argument's sake, we're not the investors for Kodak, where you know your people are no longer using films; they're all moving to digital, right? Or we're not going to be investors in you know the postal service because that by and large is declining, right? So we are looking for sectors where there are intrinsic growth characteristics, you know, either. Uh, you know, the demand for those, it's a new product and, you know, like for argument's sake, streaming, right, uh, of, of um, uh, like Netflix and so on and so forth. N not to say we're investors in that. Uh, but in some of the sectors we chose was, uh, was for example, convenience stores, right? That's a sector that's growing as the shift from un unorganized to organized has appeared. Uh, or the credit bureau, which we own, CITOS, the largest credit bureau in Malaysia. And we knew we had to educate Malaysia about responsible lending and responsible borrowing, and we've introduced a whole bunch of products. So, so, so firstly, is choosing the industry. The second thing we do is we actually go out and meet 300 companies a year. So we have some basic thesis. We start with, okay, we like the retail industry in Malaysia. So what we then do is we channel that team, and their job is to go and meet every retail company they can find in Malaysia. So they go on a Saturday, they list down every mall, they walk malls and they list down every shop and then they write to the companies and then they go and see the owners. And in this lengthy process and painful process of getting meetings and cataloging these meetings, we then identify interesting companies, right? And what are the characteristics of interesting companies? Well, firstly, we look for market leaders, right? We look for in each segment, like one of our most successful investments in Malaysia is Mr. DIY, right? Which is now a household name. And we found them from one of these exercises. And we thought, wow, these stores are really busy. It took us a while to convince the owners uh, why to actually meet us. But you know, when we met them, we learned a lot about them. And what we could see is they had a clear proposition that was resonating well with consumers. Right? So there's stores are busy, you know, people are shopping, and so on and so forth. We could see a very smart and capable entrepreneur uh, who had high degree of integrity. So there's no point in being smart with no integrity. Uh, or high integrity and not capability. So you need people who are capable and, and have the integrity. Uh, so proposition, good entrepreneur, and then there's a report card. In our business, lots of people spin you a story about where they're heading. Yeah. But if you don't track their performance, you won't know what they said and what they've achieved. So often we see people over time, and we've cataloged this. When we have the third meeting, we look at the results and say, Hey, you know, you told us you're going to do, you know, 10 million of profit uh, this year, but actually you've done eight. What happened, right? And uh, so there are very few companies that actually meet what they say they're going to do. Uh, and certainly, Mr. DIY was one of those that, you know, every time they gave us a number, they exceeded it. You know, so you know you got a great business, <laughs> that, right? So, so those are some of the basic characteristics, right, uh, of a business. Now, the third thing, of course, we get into the financials, right, and. You know, a lot of people get lost in financials. You can spend hundreds of hours and hundreds of lines of modeling. I look for really three or four very simple things. I look at the top line. How's the revenue growing, right? So we want, we're shooting for companies that can grow at least 15 or 20 percent. I then straight away look at the bottom line and say, how fast is the bottom line growing? Ideally, we want the bottom line to be growing as fast as revenues, right? So that means uh, the profit is growing uh, in line with revenue growth. Uh, the next thing I look at is return on equity, right? So typically in Malaysia, the average return on equity for a company is probably 10 or 12%, right? So that tells you for every dollar of money that's been invested in the business, what kind of return are you getting? And if your return on equity is low, you know, if it's single digits, then you shouldn't be growing your business because you're destroying value every day, right? And uh, so that's a very important metric. The next thing I look at is risk. What are the risks in this business, right? So the risks can be industry shifts. You know, is this industry going to be disrupted the way digital has disrupted Kodak, you know? Uh, or, you know, streaming has disrupted uh, videotapes and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's important, right? Risk, risk uh, on the entrepreneur. I mean, it, does he look healthy? You know, yeah. is, he, is he, you know, uh, is, is he going to be around in, in the time horizon we have? And what are other risks that could affect you? Government legislation is an important risk. Competition is a, not one of the reasons for meeting lots of companies is you know all their competitors and you have a sense of what the competitors' strategies are and how that might affect you know, market share, pricing, and so on in, in that industry. So risk is a very important assessment. And then finally, 
what should you pay for this asset? Which is a, it's a very difficult question because it's not a science. Otherwise, we'd all have it right, right? So why does somebody think that Old Town should, be, should trade at 10 times earnings the day before we bought it, and a week later, it was trading at 15 times earnings, and a year later, it was trading at 20 times earnings, right? So it's the Brahmal name. <laughs> <laughs> so that we, we look at, uh, and I think the danger that a lot of uh, young people make, you know, who don't have a lot of history in investing, is they look at comparables in only in the last one or two years. And they say, well, that company trades at that multiple. You know, the, we work, you know, trades at $47 billion, and that should be the benchmark for all co-working spaces. Well, the more important question is to look at uh, what Warren Buffett would say, look at a 10-year history and see how have companies in this sector traded over longer periods of time and then, you know, they're going to be highs and lows, and you find some kind of, you know, average, you know. So, so if I had to summarize it, to, be a good in, to find a good investment, you want uh, to look at growth, return on equity, risk, and uh, you need to be in a good sector with a great entrepreneur, and you have to pay the right price. So, so it's pretty easy. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Easier said than done. But the imperfect, the imperfect science is trying to size up the other guy, right? When you meet the guy, he can be like Adam Newman of WeWork, right? Charismatic, abulent, um, um, visionary, whatever. It's only later on when the warts and all come out, the pimples and everything come out, right? How do you size up the entrepreneur? How do you size up, especially for people who don't have access, face-to-face -face access with, 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 with company owners, how do you size them up from afar? Even what's your gut feel? Um, i tell you the quick way. The quick way is n never do a deal straight away, right? I mean, I was quite surprised to hear that uh, SoftBank closed the deal with WeWork in half an hour. Literally, right? like, yeah. I mean, that uh, is written. I don't know if it's true, but, you know, and but you c probably is true the way they've, they've spent $100 billion in two years. You know, and there's only way to do it. It's is a mountain it, of debt it, right now, yeah. yeah. Correct. So I think the, 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 the important thing is you cannot rush these things, right? So ideally, you firstly would have met lots of players in that sector. Okay, so third party accounts. Right, exactly. So you know what the trends are the sector, and we always listen to a little bit of gossip. We ask one guy what he thinks of the others, or we ask somebody what, who do you respect most in the industry, you know, and then we try and triangulate, right? So this kind of gives you, and there's no smoke without fire when somebody says bad things about one company, there's usually a reason to be cautious, right? I mean, and I think one of my best investments ever was in a battery company in India, uh, which was the number two player, and I happened to sit on the board uh, uh, of one of the companies owned by the number one guy. And I asked this uh, owner, what do you think of your number two competitor? He said, it's a brilliant company. I went out and bought the stock immediately. Because if, the num if your competitor says you're a great company, you must be a very good company. You know? so, <laughs> so I think, I think industry knowledge, industry uh, gossip, industry experts are very important, right? So you get a third. The second thing that's a good way is track record. Right? It's like report cards. You don't become a A student overnight. Right? You can tell what happened in Form 1, Form 2, Form 3, Form 4, Form 5. There's a high probability that's going to dictate what your Form 6 results are going to be. Right? So similarly in businesses, you know, companies that are degrowing for five years rarely turn around in the year six unless you've changed something. You know, change yeah. management often is the starting point. Right? So track numbers speak for itself. Right? And I think these are two things. I am not necessarily the best, if you just put a guy in a room and ask me to assess his capabilities, I'm not sure I'm necessarily the best guy in doing that, right? Because people can spin stories, they can, you know, tell you what their, uh, you know, view of the world is and so on, you know? And yeah. so, so, and look, we've made mistakes, I think, in, in backing uh, entrepreneurs in the, in the past. Um, and, uh, but when I go back and reflect, often it's we, we didn't stay true to the first two things. I see. There so were there enough were red flags in, in one and two to have told us number three. But then the, the numbers might have dazzled too much or the prospects might have dazzled too much. Oh, you believe the story. Yeah. Right? You believe yeah. the spin, I call it. Right? Well, Theranos for one, right, in the US. Correct. Yeah. 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 Even WeWork to some extent. Correct. Yeah. Um, so how do you come back from those? You just got to well, make I, sure I that think, the mistakes I are think, smaller? No, no, I think, yeah, that's a good point. So I think where we have made mistakes like that, I think we also had a feeling that the risks were high. So fortunately, we scaled back and we did smaller investments. 
And fortunately, where we felt really gung ho, we uh, we put big checks, and sometimes we tranched in, right? So some of our most successful investments, we actually said, you know, we love your story. It's a lot of money for us. Can we do it over two years or three years? And we may end up paying a higher price each time, but we gain certainty in doing that, right? And and uh, so that's a trade-off, right? And and I think that's uh, helped us. Uh, helps us helped us considerably, you know. So. so, in terms of growing credo as a businessman yourself, I think you're in five countries. Um, interestingly, as you were saying, uh, look, go to where the puck is going to be. So you're in um, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, India, right. clearly Malaysia, but yep. not Singapore, which you call Singapore, right? Right. Um, <laughs> interesting uh, analogy. Um, what's the plan? Because 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 Bridgewater might be one comparable, right, in the US. Bridgewater, sure. Ray Dalio, he's, I don't know how much he's got. He's listed, right? Right. Um, so what's the plan? How, how do you plan to grow Creator? What's well, the idea? Well, look, I think first thing in life you have to decide yeah. is do you want to live in a beautiful city where everything is perfect? Or are you an adventurer? So which one are you? Right. So clearly I made my choice. We're an adventurer, <laughs> you know. So we go to places where others haven't been. Yeah. You know, we lived in Malaysia, we went to India, right, uh, which was an adventure and uh, a great experience for my, for my wife, my family, and myself. Um, and we met, aside from lots of great businesses, lots of great friends in that process, right? So, so the question is, when you want to start a business like ours, do you sit in Singapore because you have a perfect uh, uh, life, a nice, uh, safe country with... Uh, uh, great uh, lawn and, and a nice building and an uh, airport that works all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but there's nothing to invest in Singapore. Yeah. So why are you in Singapore? Can you be domiciled there and do business outside? You can. And that's what people do. They sell their investors the story that, you know, we cover the region from Singapore. But the reality is the deals are not in Singapore. The deals are in Kuala Lumpur, in Surabaya, in Ho Chi Minh, in yeah. Manila. And you have to be local. So we made this decision day one that we are going to have offices where the deals are. And our offices are going to be staffed by locals, right? So in Malaysia, we're a completely Malaysian team. In Indonesia, it's a completely Indonesian team. In, in Vietnam, we're a Vietnamese team and so on, right? So why do we want to be local? Because locals understand the culture. If you've grown up in a, in a, in a country like that, you have hopefully relationships. Uh, you know, you grew up with somebody, you went to school with somebody else, you went to tuition class with another guy, you played hockey with the fourth guy, you went drinking with the fifth, and, and so on, right? And that's how relationships are built, right? And, uh, and then, of course, you have to apply yourself, right, with some science, which is what I was talking about. The science of this business is going out, meeting lots of people, right? It's a painful process, but uh, once you, you do all of these things, then... You know, I mean, God helps those who help themselves. So if you meet a thousand people, you're more likely to be, you know, to meet more interesting companies than if you meet 10, right? That's so, right, that's yeah. right. And then private equity is really growing because 20 years ago, it didn't really exist in this country. And judging from the capital markets where they are, it's not existent. But private equity, with the right deals and the right formula, you just get the sense that Asia is just about to happen. ASEAN is just about to happen. 630 million people, a lot of family-owned companies, many of them are Mr. DIY, and uh, relatively unknown, but amazing numbers, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's really the future of finance, private equity? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, private equity as a concept has been around for 50 years. One yeah, of yeah. the oldest uh, firms in the world is TA Associates, which, right. which was uh, created in my year of birth, 1968. And, uh, and, but I think over the last... Um, maybe 10 or 20 years, the industry has really exploded. And it's exploded because uh, the returns, historical returns that people have delivered have been much higher than what uh, they've got in public markets. Right? And so there has been a shift of allocation towards private equity. In, in Western markets, private equity allocation can be 10, maybe even 15% of the portfolio of a good endowment or pension fund. Right? In Asia, like if we look at some of our local funds and so on, uh, like EPF, I think their private equity allocation is only 4%, right? In, in some of the others, they're you know, somewhere between 2 and 3 and 4%. So it's still quite low. And uh, so I think the second thing is that, uh, of course, companies are growing. They need more capital. Uh, thirdly, valuations are going up, so people are overpaying. I think what's the danger of having a lot of private equity dollars? Uh, but four, entrepreneurs are realizing that actually going public too early can be 
a drag because uh, it costs a lot of money and it's a big distraction having to do an IPO process for a year and then to have to serve investors, you know, or you can be like half the Malaysian companies who just don't bother about the 49% who are owned by, you know, uh, <laughs> That's right. the minorities, you know. The value traps. Yeah, they're just yeah. family businesses that uh, happen to be public, you know, and yeah. that's a big concern in Malaysia. But, <coughs> but so, so I think private equity has given entrepreneurs the capacity to, you know, raise money whilst they're private, build it out longer before, uh, before going public. And in some cases, entrepreneurs get to a point they say, look, I'm just going to sell my company instead of you know, going through this task of going public. You know? So is private equity the future? Yes. But I would say that we are at the peak of a private equity cycle and we are going to see some major downturn in the next few years because there's been too much money raised, returns are getting compressed, and you're competing with giants like SoftBank, which are throwing money um, like, you know, there's like no tomorrow. Yeah. And then you see deals. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should say this, but um, y you know, I'm, I'm sure your good friends at Navis um, would have been um, would have done their due diligence where buying Duran companies is concerned. But again, I mean, 400 ringgit, is, 400 million ringgit is a lot of money. Um, but that's be that's really weird because markets right now, the public markets are so distressed, especially in Malaysia, and you would think that there's a lot of cheap assets um, f for the taking, but they, they aren't really. Um, maybe because, as you say, the entrepreneurs are not feeling the heat yet. They're not feeling the distress yet. Do you think it's going to go down a couple more legs? Do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? Sure. So, so I think th there are two different questions here. So one is, one of the states of the market, right? Yeah. So I think it's not just a Malaysia issue. Unfortunately, we had an incredible run from 2011, 2012 to 2017, 2018. Global markets did very well. The S&P 500 delivered 16% a year for that period, you know, and so on. And uh, But markets don't stay up forever, right? And they, are, they go through cycles, whether it's seven or 10 years or whatever. And I think we're coming to the end of the cycle. That market push has also been led by a lot of money being pumped in by you know, yeah. governments and so on. So now in Malaysia, we have an additional problem, right? We have soft, uh, soft environment in ASEAN and we have some uncertainty in Malaysia with a lot of sectors, you know, uh, as the government's changed and policies have changed, right? That's caused... Uh, is that why Malaysia is so unloved right now in terms of the market? People invest in places where they can make money. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. To make money, you have to have growth and you have to have, uh, uh, you know, profit growth and you have to have good returns, right? When you look at the, and a, the measure of growth is you look at earnings per share growth. That's a very simple measure, right? When earnings per share grows, if companies, like we went through this process in Malaysia in the 90s, right? Massive growth, and it was a very exciting market. Everybody wanted to be here, but there's no growth. Look at the average growth rate of the 1,000 companies on the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange. It's anemic. And so if the businesses don't grow, Investors can put their money in any number of other places, starting with the United States, where they don't even have to get on a flight and travel 24 hours across the globe. That's right. right. So people will come. So it's China. <coughs> Why did China do so well uh, in the last 20 years? Is because it went through massive growth, industrialization, you know, growth across sectors, and it was a great place to be. Why is Alibaba a 10 cent a great stock? Because they were growing explosively. Why is Amazon a great stock? Right. So people invest in growth, right, and. Our biggest problem as a country, uh, we are a young country that's behaving like an old person. Right? <laughs> we are at the stage that we yeah. should still be growing our companies 10-15% uh, at least. Right? So companies, I think entrepreneurs who have done, who've done well have become risk averse. The biggest 10 groups are sitting on billions of dollars of cash. Why aren't they reinvesting in new things? Right? I mean, if this was the United States which has which sells 16 million cars a year and so on. They could have just stayed like that. But no, a new concept called Uber came along and totally revolutionized how you travel. And that became a global idea, right? So there's always innovation and so on. In Malaysia, I think we're lacking innovation, you know? And in many companies in which we have bought, uh, especially control in, uh, like CITOS and Bake With Yen, we bought into companies that were not growing at all. And what we did was we crashed profits in the first two years we reinvested in people, came up with lots of new solutions, new products, 
invested heavily in sales. You know, we, in one of our companies, we went from 10 salespeople to 150 salespeople. And so then we, just, yeah. and that way, the business has gone from 50 million to 150 million in revenue in five years. So more companies are not doing that. I think the other problem we have, if we look at public companies in Malaysia, if we take out the top 20 of them, a lot of them are controlled. You know, it's not like the US where there's no controlling shareholder and, and if a public activist buys 3%, they can rattle management. In Malaysia, we have tons of companies where the owners own exactly 50.1% and then they can go to sleep and play golf, you know, three times a week, you know, and they can hand over the, the business to their kids who may not necessarily be as capable as they are. You know, so. Yeah, that's very interesting what you just said because the old modus operandi for high potential businesses which are not as aggressive as they should be you go in there as you see you crash profits for the first two years you reinvest but then you've got to have a compliant owner that is willing to do that with you right. most of ASEAN is run by family companies that don't have that mentality they don't want to have that um, growth trajectory they just want to sit tight and play golf <laughs> how do you deal with that? so, so we have two models uh, so 80% of our investments are minority investments, right? So in that model, it's very simple. We're looking for the YY Tans of the world in Mr. DIY, right? He's a, a you know, capable, driven entrepreneur who wants to build a big business and has a successful formula, and he needs some capital to help him get there, right? So when we do minority investments, our model is good industry, great entrepreneur, and great track record. Co-tails. Because you can't change a weak entrepreneur and make him a great entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. So the the second model where we crash profits and stuff is usually in control investments. So there we may be buying into a good industry that in a market leader or the number two player, but they've lost the desire to reinvest in the business, perhaps because they are, you know, uh, older, right? And they don't want to take risks, which is a fair point. I'm at 60, I probably won't be taking the same risk that I'm doing when I was 40, right? You so don't look a day over 40. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in those companies, often our, our partners stay on with us, yeah. right? And they, they, they may own 10 or 20 or 30%. And we say to them, look, this is our plan for your business. We'll have to go through a, a, a transition period, but trust us, we will get there, right? And, and I think we take them through this journey because we want them to stay and be part of that journey. And, uh, and that's, that's something that's worked quite well for us. You know? So there's a lot of people out there in Malaysia and beyond who are running successful SME businesses. Some of them with six figures, um, in fact, nine, nine figure uh, revenue targets, uh, numbers every year. And they don't have, maybe they don't have the knowledge or the, the network um, to, to, to grow to those trajectories. What, what, do you, what do you tell them? What do you tell the typical Chinaman entrepreneur who's running a hundred million ringgit revenue company, I don't know, selling seafood or whatever, but he's got no clue, or, or even doesn't sure. have the doesn't have the temperament to even think about these things. Sure. What do you tell them? Well, the first thing is, you know, I shouldn't be the guy lecturing them because they've been an entrepreneur and being an entrepreneur is tough, right? So they made that call, they took the risks, they built a business, and they deserve all the success that they've got, right? So that's number one. Number two, I will say that you are right, that uh, like any country, we have a very large SME ecosystem that really drives this country. The country yeah. is not driven by the top 20 companies, it's driven by the hundreds of thousands of SMEs that hire five people, right? That's what drives this economy. Now, often it's an issue, uh, I think the common issues I've seen, uh, one is vision. Right? Some people say, look, I'm just happy having a small business with four people because that's what I can manage and I don't want the complexities of having partners and shareholders and so on. Nothing wrong with that. Then they go down a certain path and maybe they're happy you know, with the kind of earnings that they have. But I do think there is a group of people who have the capabilities to do much better. Right? And for them, I say, one is focus. Once you may need to try two, three, four, five different things. But over time, you will figure out what are the one or two things that really makes a difference. You have to have the, the capacity to drop the other three. Because if you try and do five things, you're never going to be successful. The second thing is then have a, have a vision. Benchmark yourself against the best in the world. Right? So you know, if you think Apple is the best in computing, you can be the Apple in your category. Right? And then figure out what does it take to get there. Right? And sometimes it's not easy to do it yourself. You may need advisors, mentors. You may need to attend conferences, read, travel. You know, 
uh, one of our partners uh, in, in a very successful company called GHL, Simon told me how he started his mobile reload business because he went to the UK. He, he was selling mobile phones and then he got tired of that and he went to the UK and he saw this electronic mobile top-up system and he said, why can't I do that in Malaysia? He came back and he built what became Malaysia's largest um, you know, mobile reload uh, platform which then became the largest payments business in Malaysia. Concept arbitrage. Exactly. Yeah. So I think entrepreneurs should do what Simon did which is to get on a plane and go to other markets whether it's Singapore or London or New York or San Francisco and see how other people are doing it and adapt what can be done here, right? And uh, so I think vision, what you want to build it. Next is people. You have to understand and some of the biggest challenges we have with companies that are 50 and 100 million going to 300 million is people. Often you have an entrepreneur, maybe uh, family members around him who have helped him in that first journey. But to get to the next journey, you need professionals. And professionals start with a, a willingness to change and B, are you prepared to delegate some of the things that you used to do yourself? Are you prepared to pay up a bit, right? And so on. And a lot of what we do with our companies is around hiring and getting them the next generation of leaders so they can make the next, you know, next move. And in some cases, it's about sharing some of your equity with your key people, right? So, so that's another you know, very important uh, part of the journey, right? And Is that something you're okay with, even as a businessman yourself, to share equity? To I think you have to. Majority you, have even to. you have to. I yeah. think our, our, I mean, not only in our firm, but in every <coughs> company we invest in, one of the first things we do is we say, how much are we setting aside for the operating management teams in these companies, right? And then how do we award it, right? And often it's awarded based on you know, uh, goals that we set annually over five years. You know? So they have to earn it over five years based on goals that they achieve, right? So. so having achieved this kind of success in your life and in business, right? Um, is, I mean, there's obviously there's, there's four or five buckets that everybody juggles on a, di on a you know, year to year basis. Mm -hmm. um, your family life, your children, you know, your, 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 your parents, for example. Um, how have you dealt with those? Because obviously it's taken a lot of your time. I mean, when you read Robert Kwok's autobiography, he was 99% of the time on the road, right? Always in London, trading this and trading that, right? Uh, well, how did you traverse sure. that, that yeah. side? Well, I, I think when you're building a business, uh, uh, there was a time, especially in the early days of uh, Chris Capital, uh, when I was in the US. It's not a sacrifice. And, and having to go to yeah. India, you know, 25% uh, of the time, or even starting credit on earliest, you know, that's a sacrifice. So I think firstly, you need a great uh, partner, uh, and, and in my case, my wife, Shanti, who is supportive, right, and, and uh, um, you know, in that journey. It puts uh, huge pressure on the relationship because we don't see each other, right? I mean, right. clearly, it's, it'd be humans after all. Correct. How, how, did, you, how did you address well, that? Well, I think, I think, you know, you, you kind of talk about it before you start the journey. Okay, right? so and she's got a buy-in. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. she's a buy-in. She's always been <sighs> a, great, a great supporter, and even when I'm in doubt, she's pushed me, so uh, that's, nice. that's been great. But I think secondly, you have to find the balance, right? And I think uh, I'm not necessarily somebody who's burning the midnight all every day. I'm fairly disciplined going back at seven. I mean, occasionally, you know, we have dinners and so on and so forth. You find the time for, you know, for your children. And when my parents were alive, I'm very happy we were back for the five or six years uh, before they passed away and being able to see them in weekends and speak to them on the phone every day. Uh, and uh, and then have time for you know for for you know for friends in laws and, and so on. So I think it's it's about finding the balance. And um, uh, I I think I'm, I don't think we're perfect, but I think we've got a reasonable balance at least. You know. What are principles of life? What is the Brahmal Vasudevan um, recipe for life? Is what is the direction? I mean, having attained six decades, right? You've come to some kind of sagely wisdom, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people are too focused on money. Some people are too focused on spirituality. Some people are too focused on fitness, right? Whatever, whatever floats their boat. What What's your recipe? Um, well, I tell you, one great book I I read uh, about twenty years ago. Was, twenty years ago was. Okay. Uh, um, the Pursuit of Happiness by Bertrand Russell. Yeah. And, uh, it was a, is an incredible book because yeah. I think it really simplifies your life. Uh, so one is, I think we all know, obviously money is important, right? Uh, it's, you can't say money is not important. Uh, and I think, uh, but, but uh, money is not everything. So you need enough money to be able to send your children to good schools and, you know, 
have enough money for retirement and so on and so forth. But I think it's about a, you know, enjoying life. So you, there is a time to work hard and there's a time to enjoy life. And, and I, I've always found it very important to, you know, to work hard and play hard. Uh, and um, as you said, when I was younger, I never took any annual leave. And I'm quite happy to take a month every summer uh, to spend time with you know, my kids and my wife and so on and some friends. Now, so that's one. I think the second thing is, I think one of the learnings, one of the two of the three biggest learnings for, for me out of that book was don't benchmark yourself, right? I mean, benchmark is important because you wanna you know, do better and so on and so forth. But if you go out always saying, hey, my benchmark is, you know, uh, Robert Koch or Bill Gates or whoever, you'll always be frustrated with life because you'll never be good enough, right? So I think be satisfied with what, your, uh, what you have and what your capabilities are and try to be the best in, in that area, right? So if you're a chef in KL, then be the best chef in KL. Or yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah. don't have to be the best chef in, <laughs> in the, the world, world, right? So, so th this is idea of delayed gratification, right? Because there's, there's a time in your life when mm -hmm. you're sacrificing everything for the business or everything for the investments. Sure. At what point in time, what markers in life do you realize, okay, it's time to have some balance. Let's, let's, let's look at the other side of the equation. Sure. Right, because obviously you don't be working 99% of the time your whole life because then you might just have one year left <laughs> to enjoy life and then you might just go boom. You right. know what I mean, right? True, yeah. So well, look, I, I think, you know, when I first uh, graduated uh, from university, uh, I came back and I started my job the next week. And the same thing with business school. I just thought that Always, I, I, I didn't have uh, any money. I had lots of debt uh, from, from student <laughs> from study school. loans and yeah, so yeah. on and so forth. And I felt that that was what needed to happen, right? And uh, so we had to just get on with it, right? And uh, we took very little holidays and, and so on and so forth. And the goal was then get the experience, you know, build the experience. And when we moved to Chris Capital, again, the first few years was about, you know, just focusing, getting the business done, getting new investments done and so on. And I think over time, as you know, the business gets into a more steady state and you have more colleagues who can help you, then part of it is empowering them and that gives you also some free time for yourself, right? To think, to holiday and so on and so forth. So to me, you know, there may be times where you need to be 99% on and 1% off. And hopefully over time and ideally, you know, before you're 80 years old, but <laughs> at 51, which I am now, um, you know, to be able to say, hey, it'd be nice to have 15% of the year off yeah, yeah. for, you know, my own time and yeah. family time. You know, um, so. One of the guys that has been on this podcast, this guy called Yusuf Hashim, I think he's about 72, 73 years old now. He's a corporate guy, right? Worked till he was 53. He mapped it out very well. 53 years old, done with his job, re retired as MD of Shell. Uh, four kids raised, all went to university. And then he said, okay, I'm going to call time on my corporate life. I'm going to retire, take the money, and go traveling. He's been to the North Pole, South Pole, Patagonia, Alaska, and that, right? Um, amazing. He, he's, he sussed it out from the word go. And then he cited examples of other corporate guys who was in his class in their late 70s, mid 70s, still attending board meetings, right. crops, you know, healthy, bad, right? Billionaires, billionaires, sure. right? Sure. But no time to call their own. Right. Where are you going to spend your money? Correct. So I think you have to find the balance. Yeah. And, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, even 60 is quite a young age to retire. Yeah. And it's nice to have some level of engagement so that, you know, you are kind of engaged. And, and some of that engagement can be uh, born. Some engagement could be playing an um, advisory mentorship role. Yeah. And in some cases, which I think Singapore does quite well with the elderly, is actually some employment because it helps them keep engaged right? yeah to stay and, yeah, relevant to stay right? fed i mean not if you're just going to be you know sort of playing golf every day that could be boring too you know there's point. nothing there right yeah. so and also donating your time to charity i mean i think the one thing you see very much in in the u.s is that people do spend a lot of time in, in you know charity can be uh, religious charity in in, in uh, churches and, and mosques and, and temples and so on but it can also be giving back you know if you have all this wisdom why not you know, uh, mentor entrepreneurs, you know, or teach in schools or give, you know, and, and I think there's so much of knowledge that we have that is not mobilized yeah. because we don't have the right <coughs> platform to connect people who have time with people who need help. Exactly, you know, and so. I think that's part of the reason why you decided to come today, Brahma, because 
um, you know, obviously you've got a lot of wisdom and advice to share. So I, I thank you for, for taking time out to come on to this podcast. I think a lot of people around the world would appreciate what you just told me. So, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, fella. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you.